Hey, this is Web3 Talks, the podcast where we learn how to build Web3 projects directly from Web3 founders. My name is Maciej Budkowski and I talk with the founders about their projects, business models, technology, community building, user acquisition strategies, and more. If you want to start your own project or are just curious about the space, this podcast will bring you answers. Stay tuned. Okay. Hey, Ivona. I'm very glad that you are here with us. And uh, this is the most proximate recording so far, because as far as I get, you are also in Warsaw right now. Yeah. Hi, Maciek. <laughs> yes, I'm in Warsaw. So I hope the internet connection will be good <laughs> as we are not that far. Yeah. Yeah, because like most guests were either from States or India. So I think today it will be a seamless experience uh, for <laughs> us. So like, you know, for a start, like I've read a lot about UI, I've seen your works, but could you start with some kind of introduction where you tell us about your background and how you ended up in this crazy NFT world, how it happened? Yeah, of course. So I actually come from the intersection of two things. One of them is technology and machine learning, AI, and given my background in mathematics, and also right now I'm finishing a PhD in artificial intelligence. So it's definitely something on the science part. But at the same time, there was another part of me that was very art related and I've been doing photography since I've been 18 years old. So I was also doing some commercial photography works, mostly on the weekends in like parallel manner to this science a part of me. Yeah, but just two years ago, I found a, a path to intersect those two areas of interest. And this was where I, I felt this aha moment of like finding the perfect niche of something that I could do that I could really, really love to do. So yeah, the AI art has been this thing for me. And it never really started about NFTs. It was just doing some projects for myself, maybe sharing them for media festivals or for some museum showcases. And the NFT kind of happened by accident uh, mm -hmm. afterwards. I mean, I was actually on Clubhouse in March this year quite a lot. And I don't know if you've been there at that time, but there were suddenly popping up so many rooms related to NFTs. And I mean, everybody during the pandemic was probably just sitting at home and mm -hmm. talking with folks from around <laughs> the world. So yeah, it was a bit a uh, bizarre time to be in. Uh, but yeah, I started hearing that quite a lot. And after some time, I kind of realized that I just have to try this NFT thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I didn't even have any crypto experience back then. I work with technology, but my blockchain knowledge was kind of limited, you know, just the basics. I have never invested into Bitcoin or Ethereum mm -hmm. by that point. So yeah, I had to figure out how to set up wallet, figure out that it's not possible to do a Revolut app. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it was the start then. You know, that's pretty interesting because I see that for many people, NFTs are the gateway to this web free world. Like, you know, you were on this artist site, which is pretty like a small group of people. But, you know, I started my crypto experience also with NFTs, which is like, you know, I was like, okay, you have to get some wallet. What is that? Like, you have to buy something, send it. And I think NFTs are interesting first step for people to get the crypto. And do you use this mathematics and AI experience? I mean, in this sense that have you used your own algorithm or have you used something from the internet? Like how have you started with your AI works? Yeah. So to be honest, for me, NFTs was also the introduction to the web free world in a similar manner. And uh, I use a lot of the technology in my art creation. So when I employ algorithms for neural network training, but with regards to producing an actual NFT and writing the using writing the certificate, it's not something where I employ AI. I have mm -hmm. not really, to be honest, seen many applications of AI directly in the contracts. I think this is something that we are yet to see. 
there are definitely many interesting applications that I would like to explore. For example, when I'm training a model, my outputs, they are changing with time. So mm -hmm. I would really love to produce an NFT also that would be corresponding to different outputs from the model or maybe oh. NFT that would be changing with time or training with time. So yeah, those wow. would be really cool applications, but I haven't really done that because on the technology side, there's still some limitations. Mm -hmm. So first of all, the blockchain itself only can hold a small amount of, of memory limitations. So it has to point somewhere and okay. you cannot really deploy a model inside NFT. So there is a lot of complications that I think that will be soon overcome mm -hmm. with the development of, of the technology and perhaps with the new blockchains as well. We never know what's, what's there to come mm -hmm. next. You know, it would be very cool to have an NFT that changes with the seasons, you know, like in the winter, you have different NFT in the spring, yeah. in the summer, <laughs> because it would use this digital um, feature of an NFT, you know, because as it's not static, then it can move and, and really add some new value depending on the weather. Okay, and you know, I've spoken with some NFT artists and most of them told me that the biggest barrier for them is distribution. They create an art, and even if it's the best art in the world, if they don't have enough eyeballs to look at them, then there won't be enough bidders to bid for their NFT. So I would like to ask you, how have you sold your first NFT, and how do you distribute or promote your works right now? Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's definitely one of the key challenges when, when starting in this space. So the one thing to realize is that as NFT is so young and this whole community is quite different from the web too, there are many people or artists or creators who have been really famous in web two and they mm -hmm. had like a million followers. And then suddenly what's really interesting is they might create an NFT and uh, they might get those eyeballs, but mm -hmm. those will be the wrong eyeballs. So <laughs> they will not even sell okay. that. So one thing that is on one hand side, it's demo oh my gosh, <laughs> democratizing <laughs> that everybody is equal in a term that everybody starts from zero. Mm -hmm. So many people are new to the space and everybody started with their zero following. So everybody gets the same head start. And now how do you grow? It's up to you. So there is one thing that is an advantage of, you know, let's say, starting from scratch. But mm -hmm. now to do that, you have to go to the right places. All of them are virtual. So that's also something that is very positive for, mm -hmm. for us as well, as we are not living in London or New York. And mm -hmm. we have the same opportunities as folks who are living, you know, in those places where everything's happening. Mm -hmm. And right now I can just go to Twitter spaces, to clubhouse rooms, to meet those people. And I would say that meeting the community would be the key number one aspect of gathering your audience of mm -hmm. people and of collectors who would be interested in your work. So for my NFTs, the great majority of collectors came from Twitter, from noticing the work on Twitter. There is a small part of collectors who actually came from the physical world. So, but these mm -hmm. were related to some exhibitions. Like in one case, it was an exhibition in Frankfurt where the collector decided to buy the NFT as his first actually acquisition. And it was also the case with the work that I sold at Sotheby's, the collector that bought it. I discussed with her later and she mentioned to me that it's her first NFT work. So those are the exceptions, but mm. they kind of fit with the rule that most of them usually come from discords, clubhouses and Twitters. So you really have to be active in this space and to be active with other artists, also supporting smaller artists, or sharing the work, talking everywhere. Well, I mean, even being everywhere. So showcasing your work as much as possible in the virtual space and crypto voxels or in the physical as well. Mm -hmm. So it seems that it, you need to have two heads, like one head is the artist and the other is like a promoter, agent, or marketer, like whatever word that, that you might use. 
Well, not really, to be honest. The problem <laughs> is you have to do all that yourself mm -hmm. because you might lose credibility. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the collectors and, well, everybody's talking about removing the barriers between mm -hmm. artists and collectors. And this is also something that the collectors really appreciate that. So they really want to talk with the real you. They want to know what's the story behind the work. They might want to ask you questions. And if they resonate with the story, if they resonate with your creative process, they will be interested in collecting. But if you had a third person who will be mm -hmm. telling those stories instead of you, that would not be a very successful strategy. So yeah, that, that's a problem. We just have to spend 24 hours a day on that or yeah, you're not going to make it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So you need to have these two heads, like two roles and, and be good with both of them. And yeah, I think it's challenging. It's kind of similar to me. Obviously, it's a very uneducated guess, but, you know, to people who are good at product, like technical people in startup, but they are not good at marketing. But here, because you are an artist, not a startup, you need to do it yourself and not with some, you cannot hire a person for marketing, or at least you shouldn't. So it seems very challenging, to be honest. Yeah, it's a bit of a challenge, definitely. I think that perhaps later we might see some more of different business models, but right now, as we are so early, it's usually more about the artist. Well, work, of course, as well, but it's so much about the story that they're trying to tell. And I would say that this is the thing that also does not get enough of attention is that nobody buys NFTs just because of their aesthetical value. And of course, so many NFTs just have no aesthetical value. They're, well, they're collectibles, for example. So there is usually something else. And this might be some kind of utility. This might be some kind of story behind a new creative process, a new medium, something used in a different manner, or just people wanting to support the artists. So this is also something that I hear quite a lot. The works are not usually bought for just the single work. So there is not many collectors who would just see this one work and they would just buy that, but they will usually go to see artists' body of work and see if they like that and try to learn as much as possible and only then to make the decision to acquire the piece. Oh, I resonate with that because one of the few NFTs that I've bought, because I own like maybe five, is from the digital creator that was doing YouTube videos with music and combining them with very inspirational speeches. So his name is Akira Dedon, and I was listening to him for many years. And, you know, you cannot buy his album because he's internet creator so he has no albums and when i bought his nfts i felt that it's kind of like a patronage like i just want to you know let him earn something for all this cool work that he has done but i knew him all along like i've watched like hundreds of his videos so i totally resonate with your comment and i'm also wondering because you're ai nft artist and it sounds like a job from a sci-fi novel and <laughs> I'm wondering, like, <laughs> you know, like, how does it look like? Like, what do you do, actually? Like, you know, you wake up. Uh, <laughs> I know that you also do your PhD, so we can just, you know, cut it out and just focus on the NFT part. Yeah, that's really a fascinating comment. And I really like this description. <laughs> so I might use that. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's really a mix of both. So yeah, when I wake up, I usually start with reading some articles and trying to catch up with the science world. And being AI artist also means that you have to stay relevant with the newest architectures, newest models. There is just so many exciting solutions coming into the light every day. And uh, I just have a list of all those things that I want to try out and experiment with. And it's really long, so I'm getting longer every day. But I mean, it's, it's definitely a key element to working with technology. You don't want to work with something that is yesterday's news. So yeah, that would be the first thing. And uh, afterwards, I would say that it would depend on the part of the project that I'm working on because every project has several phases. And the first phase would be the data collection 
or even posing a creative question. So figuring out what I want to explore with my next project. Is it memories? Is it reflections? Is it maybe some sociological issue that I want to answer or maybe just analyze? So I would start with that and then figure out what kind of information and data do I need to do this project. So, well, usually I work with my own photographs and sometimes those might come from the archive as I have more than 10 years of photographs. So there's already quite a lot that can be trained on. But in many cases, I just decide to go on with something new. So I just go out and shoot exact pictures for the exact project. And yeah, this might take a while, like some weeks even, because I don't want to force myself when I'm just not feeling like it. So one day I might do 10 photographs and a different one, it might be 100. So it really, really depends. So yeah, sometimes this is the part of the process that goes for a long time. When I have that figured out, I will do the training. So that will be the coding part the pre-processing of the photographs as well, and then throwing them into the machine learning model and leaving that for days as well. It might also take quite a while. So I will get back to the model. So every day I check the outputs that are currently generated with AI and they will change with the time. There might be some issues, so it, I might not like the direction where it's going or I might like it. So it really also be fascinating to see what's in there. And this is, this is one of the parts of the process that I like most is kind of checking in with the AI and seeing what it has learned so far. And at this point, I might even try exploring the model already and preparing some generative outputs and just, you know, playing around and, and seeing how it looks like. I might also figure out that there is something in the data that I don't really like. So maybe the images produce some colors that I don't really like or some artifacts, or maybe the data distribution is too limited. So then I might go back to step one and kind of remove some images from the training data or add some new ones or change them. So this process is really, really working in a way that it's a lot of coming back to previous steps, reiterating, figuring out something new and uh, just trying out quite a lot. And then when I'm happy with some of the results, of course, I might decide to publish that. If the whole project is kind of on a closed theme, I might wait to till I produce all the works and only then publish them. But it's also very often that I come back to the themes that I have previously explored. As the most fascinating thing with AI models is that they produce almost literally the infinite number of generative imagery. So some of them might look similar, but there is usually something unexplored. So I might come back after two months to a previously used model and then suddenly realize, oh, wow, there is this super cool visual that I haven't seen. Let's explore this direction. And then I would produce some animations or more things and kind of create some new work, or maybe even take two, like take an old model and take a new model and mix them together on different layers of the architecture and also see how it looks like. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of experimentation and playing. So no two days are alike, to be honest. Wow, it sounds like a very complex process to produce an art. And, uh, you know, like on one hand, when you produce art, very often you discover something that you haven't known before, because, you know, you feel you are in the flow and you kind of push the envelope. But here, on one hand, you discover things that you produce, but you also discover things that your model has produced. Yeah, exactly. So it's very interesting. And how do you get these inspirations? Because you said that if you don't feel like you are, you know, you don't feel inspired, you may not produce a lot of art. And I, I know that for many artists, inspiration is important. And, you know, to find it, they may read, they may travel, they may party, do drugs, listen to the music. <laughs> like there are countless options. And I'm wondering what's your thing for looking for an inspiration? Yeah, definitely. So I would say inspiration usually comes unexpected. This is why I have this also analog notebook of keeping mm -hmm. ideas handy and uh, just anything that comes into mind. 
and it is sometimes ideas for the projects or might even be ideas for descriptions or even just like a cool combination of words, cool combination of colors, of textures that I might want to explore. But to get that, the main point for me would be educating myself and learning from other artists. And uh, as I ha don't have any formal background in arts, I only finished photography studies. So, well, I, I studied some photographers, but, and of course I studied some art, but not in a formal way. So this is why I'm really excited still about learning about all those masters. And I have many albums. This is my favorite thing to bring from vacations is actually to buy some old albums and some used bookstore. So there's quite a lot of them and they're on painters, on photographers, on many great artists that I admire. But yeah, a lot of them are classical, let's say, artists, and I would read for that. And it might be something completely unrelated. So when you're studying some surrealist painter or photographer, you don't usually see any applications to AI art as it's so different. But the mind usually works in a way that when you, you just don't know how it will work, it just might produce some ideas suddenly unexpectedly. And this is usually what happens. So I don't try to kind of force this inspiration by, you know, looking at images and thinking, oh, I should train a model on that, but kind of, you know, letting it do its own work by just studying, looking, and exploring. One huge part of the inspiration would be all those classical masters and and of course, also, I get inspired quite a lot by more contemporary artists. So, yeah, I read uh, many magazines related to photography and to art. And yeah, just looking at inspiring, incredible works sometimes gives you inspiration at a later time. <laughs> okay. You know, you said about inspiration and about the model. So this is the thing that bugs me and I haven't asked about it before, is how do you train your model? Like, do you just put your pictures in the model or you just put some different pictures in the model or it works totally different and I'm just, you know, doing very uneducated comments right now? Yeah, no worries. That's a very relevant question. So I usually put my own photography collections into that. This is why quite often I will produce the inputs specifically for model. Also, I have done quite a lot of collaborations this year. So in this case, I would take some of my, let's say, photographs and also work with an, another visual artist who, for example, produces photographs or collages, and we will prepare a common data set to explore something together. So those will be the most common ones. For some of the projects, like there is one project that is not even NFT, but I tried playing with old photographs from the museum and I produced those people faces that were showing particular emotions. It was a very interesting topic for me to explore how artificially created humans from the past can show realistic emotions and gives you this uncanny feeling. So yeah, there is, of course, this issue, of course, of what kind of data can you use? So I prefer to stay on the safe side and use my own data. And there is a lot of discussion in AI art for artists using GANs about whether you could use images that are on the internet. Can you use something like pictures of paintings? Because this is definitely something that is not really defined as the... Outputs from the model, they are completely generative. So if you train a model on 1000 of Monet's paintings, it would produce something that would be, of course, stylistically similar. But the problem is that not a single pixel would be the same. So the issue of licensing and mm -hmm. kind of the commercial use starts to get quite difficult because you cannot really prove and yeah how can you prove maybe it well if it looks very similar it might be obvious but if it's a bit less similar it's even mm -hmm. more difficult to tell that it was created by using this kind of imagery and yeah that's this is a very difficult thing to be able to say afterwards because when you have a trained model it has no memory of the data so mm -hmm. it's just not theoretically possible to say what it was trained on. The model would be just a bunch of numbers that produce something. And the only way to say it's like by visually checking 
or mm -hmm. maybe finding the closest match in the model to the real image. But those usually will be different because model does not memorize anything. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's a lot of ethical and legal issues that might arise when you start training on the images that are not yours. Yeah, but nonetheless, it's something that, yeah, I, I think that will have to be figured out in the future. Mm -hmm. So can we say that you are going to be immortalized? I mean, like, if you die and there are these models and your data sets, <laughs> like, you can still produce art even though you won't be here anymore. <laughs> well, <laughs> kind of. But uh, it's still quite a huge part is about curation. So if the data sets are still there, then of course it will be able to produce more of those. And it's one way of thinking about immortalizing. But then when you have the outputs and you generate them, then there is a question, which of the outputs would you publish? Mm -hmm. Maybe all of them, but then again, I don't, I usually do some kind of selection and curation, which is dependent on my vision for this project, for example. So this is this other part of curation that cannot be automated mm. that easily. And couldn't you create a model of your curation as well? Like, you know, train it like, <laughs> how does Ivana think? Uh, yeah, I mean, this is like a very philosophical discussion, but I, I found it, uh, you know, interesting. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you could definitely train a classifier that would say, would Ivana choose this one or not? <laughs> so yeah, so that's a good idea. Okay, maybe if you retire, you know, you, you, <laughs> then you can uh, <laughs> yeah. produce this kind of stuff. And I have a question because you mostly do one-on-one works, like this unique as far as I understand. You don't yes, do like... mostly, yeah. And, you know, this process that you described uh, is pretty complex. So I'm wondering how long does it take from, you know, idea to listing on some auction house? Yes. Yeah, so one thing here is that even though the works are one of one, there will be multiple outputs coming from the same model. So it's not like that I have to train a new model for every single one of them. Usually I would produce no more than 20 animations from one model. Well, it also might depend on the model and on the training data. And the general rule is that the more input data you have, the more varied and the more interesting model you will get. So if you train only on 100 images, it might be interesting, but after some time, the outputs might get repeated. And if you train on tens of thousands, you might get such a fascinating model that you can work with that for, for a long time and have works that are not even similar to each other. So yeah, so that would be the number of the outputs and the process since the data collection till the producing of the outputs would take, I would say, around two months usually. But again, I might also do some experimenting where I have one model that is finished and then mix it with others. So, you know, not to go through the whole process from scratch. So yeah, it might be varied from time to time. So sometimes it just takes really short to produce any work mm -hmm. if I'm just revisiting an old one and suddenly I find a, a new and fascinating path to explore in the latent space. But other times it's going through all the steps and starting a new project and then it really takes quite some time. Okay. I have one question that I got from the people that like I got one DM with a question like how your works ended up in Sotheby's because you know it seems like very you know prestigious place to end up mm -hmm. but also not that common for NFTs maybe lately it's more common but still it's not that obvious place to end up yeah <laughs> Yeah, that definitely has been one of my main achievements in this space. And there was a funny story behind that. Two months before the Sotheby's, I actually mentioned to my husband that if I want to achieve something with these NFTs, and if I'm going to say that I made it, this is if I'm able to get to Sotheby's. <laughs> and two months later, I was able to achieve that. And he just said, well, you have to have bigger goals, Ivana, and bigger dreams because you just keep realizing them. Yeah, but it was actually a bit of a coincidence as well, I might say. And it is one of the things that 
went with my general rule that is, well, definitely a lot of amazing things happen at the right time and at the right moment. So the key thing to realize is that you have to figure out what for this time and place is perfect and find opportunities, even if you don't even know about them yet. So that was essentially the case as I was joining a lot of Twitter spaces and connecting to all of those rooms and talking to people. And just one day there was a guy from Burning Man talking about their upcoming auction with Sotheby's where they would be auctioning some works for sale and also parts of the proceeds will go to support the festival. And I was really fascinated. And uh, well, he just mentioned that briefly and then, you know, started talking different things. But I was really fascinated with the project and I couldn't even DM him. So I left a comment under one of his posts that, wow, I would love to hear more about the Burning Man and Sotheby's. And yeah, five minutes later, he actually DM'd me. And he mentioned that, wow, he just saw my work on Twitter and wow, it's really amazing that it would be so great to add my work to the auction. I was like, what? And we had a few calls and it was really last minute because they were even closing the lots. So I had to send the work, I think the next day, the next day I got the contract. I had to send the work two days later. So everything was done very much on the clock. Yeah, but it was one of those things that, that happened if you just, you know, try to do something, ask people, talk to people, you know, just make connections. So yeah, I was quite fortunate with that, but definitely Twitter helped and being in the community and actually following some of the right people and being with the right people in the right places. You know, this story, amazing story, like it reinforces the thing that you said at the start that you should, you know, hang out in places when you're an NFT yeah. artist. <laughs> <laughs> so this was like a, you know, lesson from your experience, definitely not some theory from the book. We are talking about art here when it comes to NFTs, but I'm wondering, you know, what are the areas where NFTs might be useful or you have already seen them being useful that are not art? So anything outside art? Mm, yeah, so a lot of people talk about the utility. The only place where I have seen that and I have used that was uh, when I attended the NFT NYC conference this year. What was interesting, a lot of the events had NFTs as tickets. So there have been some events where you had to have an NFT or a collectible to be able to get in. But also some of the NFTs were just plain tickets. And this was the case with the Dreamverse Gallery where I had my work exhibited and I had to show an NFT in the wallet with the ticket. And this NFT had the single purpose of being a ticket. And right now it's just a collectible ticket of an event that has happened, but it's also pretty cool that you can keep that in your wallet to remember that you attended this thing. So yeah, I think that's a very cool application and perhaps we might see that more of in the future because it just seems so natural to apply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally get it. Because, you know, when I was so younger, I was collecting this uh, normal, like physical tickets from concerts, events, but, you know, after some time, they, they fade and they don't look good. Mm -hmm. and you, know, you don't know where to hold them. So having, you know, like ticket from Burning Man, for example, in your wallet seems like a cool thing to, to yeah. have. Or, or like from concerts and, and maybe after the concert, you use this NFT to get to the Discord channel and talk with people about the concert or maybe, you know, exchange some photos or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that there are so many applications of that. So this is why if NFTs are going to go into mainstream, it's probably not only through art, but also through all those different channels. I also feel that because NFTs, as far as I understand, always or almost always have this visual part, there will be much bigger demand for art because if every ticket is an NFT, you need art for every ticket. And obviously nowadays you have tickets, but you know, when they can be 
a work of art, then why not to make it a work of art and hire some cool artists to prepare visual for, you know, for mm-hmm. a concert? Yeah, exactly. That's a very good point. And uh, we definitely see many applications to non-visual domains, such as music, poetry, but uh, as you correctly noticed, they, well, they have to have this visual element nonetheless. So even when somebody's selling a song, it has to have a cover or poetry has to be displayed somehow. So with the sole exception of selling some 3D models or some interactive code, you usually have to have this visual component. Mm-hmm. And even I, you know, this NFT artist world pretty well, as far as I understood. So I'm wondering, what are the biggest challenges that NFT artists face? Well, one of those is the one that we've discussed. So getting your art seen by the right people, by the right collectors. And also as the space grows, there is more and more people and it's going to get even more difficult to be discovered. So that's one thing. But also another one is everybody's talking about being equal, removing the gatekeepers. But nonetheless, we are seeing quite a lot of bias in this space. As we are rebuilding the community from scratch, we have those chances to build it in the right way and to have an inclusive community that is very diverse with regards to nationalities, to races, etc. But uh, the bad thing is that it's not really happening at the large scale. And even the male-female ratio is such that I don't know the exact number, but I think that only like 5 or 15% of the NFT creators that are successful are women. So while I'm very happy to be among them, I'm still very unhappy that there's just so little of that. And there is still this wide bro culture. And I don't really like that. And I hope it's going to change. But of course, it is influenced by the key factor that Even though a lot of people are coming from the traditional world, from something that was not really related to crypto, there is still a lot of people who just, you know, came from having a lot of Bitcoin in the times and Mm -hmm. they're usually a very specific demographic and they are still the key players usually. So people who bought Bitcoin early, right now they are the whales. So they decide Mm -hmm. what gets value and what does not. And that is also one of the big problems. And I hope as more and more institutions and companies come into play. And well, of course they have huge money and uh, they can also influence the space. So it will be depending on all of those key players to how we do that. And is this space going to be inclusive or just as discriminated as many other areas? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Regarding this Bitcoin whales, I yesterday I've seen on Twitter some punk that <laughs> said like, oh, I just discovered my old wallet with 58 Bitcoins. <laughs> Which <laughs> NFTs should I buy? And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so it's definitely, I, I think it's a, it's a wider thing in, in whole crypto that it's kind of being led by, maybe not led, but influenced by people who have been very early in Ethereum, Bitcoin, mostly these two. And as you said, these were like very specific people, like mostly they were very tech oriented and many of them were, had this like economic freedom mindset. And these two things correlates with being white men <laughs> at least in, <laughs> yeah. in the West. So I think that's the reason, but maybe in the long run, it will get more diverse, especially when you consider the fact that you can be, you know, pseudonymous in this NFT world. No, you can be Mm -hmm. an ape or whatever. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Well, I really do hope that, well, maybe even other blockchains like proof of stake ones, for example, Tezos might help with that because the other problem is that with the Ethereum gas fees, it's Mm -hmm. not really that huge part of world that can afford Mm -hmm. $100, $200. So even if we're not just seeing white uh, men, we are seeing people from the first world. And that's also the problem because the rich get richer. And um, hopefully with the emergence of Tezos blockchains and other blockchains that are almost free to use, 
it gets easier for people from third world countries to demand and mm. to actually sell their work. And yeah, I'm really hopeful that this will grow as already there are some artists who would not have been possible to sell the work. So yeah, that's, that's another kind of setback there. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel that Ethereum is this kind of aristocracy blockchain right now, <laughs> like, you know. Yeah. Like, <laughs> when I looked how much I paid in gas fees this year, because I entered some website where you can just type in your wallet, I was like, oh my God. Like, oh, oh God, I have to do uh, that. <laughs> or maybe not, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever I pay these gas fees, I feel like this, you know, Lashlo guy buying pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you feel that one day I'm going to regret that I spent so much, but on the other hand, there are interesting projects that you just want to try out and, and <laughs> that's yeah. how it works. And, you know, what were the most mind blowing projects in the NFT space that you've seen so far? Something that you felt like, wow, this is amazing. Well, for me, probably I'm a bit biased. So those will be the ones that employ AI. And mm -hmm. with regards to AI, I'm really fascinated by the use case of Bota project mm -hmm. and uh, the way how they employ the community and decentralized decision process making into the creation of the world and into the creation element because as we discussed before with ai art there is still the decision making and deciding which work is good and which one is not so being able to translate this process into the hands of the community is something that i really admire and for me it's such a great experiment and of course, it's doing quite well, expectedly. So yeah, that's definitely one mm -hmm. one of my favorite ones. Yeah, but also all the ones that kind of try to use any external APIs or even engage with the web free in some way or the other. And what's the name of this project that you mentioned? It's Botto Project. Botto, okay. Yeah, like it's like AI NFT DAO. <laughs> Sounds like yeah, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh my god, such a buzzword, but <laughs> it seems that it works. God. Yeah, but the the interesting thing is also that all the proceeds they I didn't remember exactly, but most of them go back to the DAO or they go into buying some new works. So yeah, it mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a very interesting concept. Okay, <laughs> like the. I'm going to definitely look it up because <laughs> it sounds very interesting. And what was the funnest thing that happened to you during this time in this NFT space? Something that made you smile or just made your day? Well, so there, I was thinking about funny things that happened in this space, but to be honest, I haven't really remembered anything interesting. I mean, there is a lot of things that put a smile to my face in the NFT space. And it's definitely that that it's so, you know, positive. And when I see my friends get, selling their work or maybe getting into showcases, it is really something about this positivity that they share that actually influences you. So, you know, sometimes you just log into Twitter and you're just smiling. So, yeah, that's a very nice and positive thing. And that people are just, you know, so supportive of each other. It's really quite weird because theoretically all artists or NFT creators are competition, right? But it does not really feel like that. And everybody's just retweeting and resharing the work. So yeah, that's definitely something that I'm really happy about. But the funny things, not, not so much. So maybe there is some potential for even comedy NFTs. I don't know. Yeah, actually, I spoke with a guy who's doing something like that. So, oh, wow, uh, that's so cool. Yeah, I haven't digged into that yet but because we are, you know, we scheduled some longer chat. But yeah, it sounds pretty interesting. You know, it, it's also something special because I talked with CryptoPom, you know, CryptoPom. Yeah, of course. So I talked with her and, and she told me that a lot of NFTs are actually bought by other artists. And it was very surprising for me. After I thought a little bit longer, it wasn't surprising at all. Because if you like art, mm -hmm. to produce art, you also like to own art, obviously. But in, in a traditional world, I don't think that artists are the main buyers because, well, they mm -hmm. don't have money to buy 
<laughs> art in most cases. So do you also mm -hmm. see this kind of movement that, you know, other artists buy pieces from their friends or, you know, people from the community? Yeah, definitely. So I, to be honest, only collected on Tezos, but it's usually this even a feeling that when you get a big sale, it's like you just want to give back to the community and you just look at some smaller artists and you're like, oh, that's actually would be so cool to also buy their work. And there is another thing that given so much positivity and direct contact with the artist, I kind of even understand collectors after I collected a few pieces because I got some DMs saying, oh, thank you so much for collecting this work. Thank you for support. And, you know, artists are willing to talk about the work and you just get this very positive rush from that. Mm. And you now have this work in your collection and you are really happy also about just supporting the person and making, you know, something into their journey so that they could go forward. So yeah, there's something in there and being a creator also and understanding the struggle, you somehow relate more to the artists also. Mm. So this is also another huge part of why would you want to collect? So yeah, I also believe that for many of the artists, it's like, you know, exchanging art. I create something, you create something and yeah, you just trade your art and it's mm -hmm. just cool, you know? Nice. Regarding Tezos, because... I know the name, but I have never used it. Where do you look for art on Tezos? Yeah, so there's actually a very interesting story also in Web3 about a platform that was called Hiketnank, and it was mm -hmm. the main platform on Tezos. But uh, it was not really decentralized in a way that, well, it was a bit experimental. It had this very edgy coder feel. You can still look it up because there are now mirrors of that. But it's like very simple. The art was on the first front. There was no likes, no follows, you know, just art. And it really sprang the whole community behind it. So it's a platform where a lot of very interesting artists go to, not a lot of commercial stuff. So you don't see that much of garbage as on OpenSea. <laughs> Sorry yeah. for the word. But yeah, it, it was really interesting in a way that community that gathered there. And it also led to Tezos popularity, the blockchain it was on. And a very cool thing, well, sorry, not cool, but a very bizarre thing happened. <laughs> so this platform was owned by one guy and he was, you know, having all the control there. And as it was an experiment for him, or not even like full-time job, he does at some point, I don't know why, I don't know the reasons, but at some point he said, sorry, I'm out, I shut down the platform. So oh. in Web2, <laughs> that would be like the end, like Mark mm -hmm. Zuckerberg going, like <laughs> shutting yeah. down the lights. There would be no Facebook, no Instagram, it would be the end. But given that we are in Web3, and the code was actually open source. The whole website was on GitHub. So what happened uh, essentially at the same time, uh, mirrors popped up and also there is another website um, based on Tezos, which is object.com. And it gained a lot mm -hmm. of popularity after the main platform shut down. And what people realized is that platforms are no longer having all the control. They're just the windows to the blockchain and mm -hmm. all the contracts are there. All the art is still sitting on IPFS. So after shutting down the platform, essentially nothing changed. And it was just mm -hmm. like this magic moment that, wow, it really works. It's like, <laughs> it's really decentralized. So I guess that in the end, it's a good thing that happened because we had like first real life experiment on what happens when platform shuts down. So it would also be the case if let's say OpenSea shut down, nothing would change essentially. And it's very reassuring to know that. So yeah, right now there is object.com and a lot of people are using that, but there is also a clone of this old Hiketnang, which is just a different domain. It's Hiketnang.art instead of Hiketnang.xyz. And yeah, people are just still using that and communities is very active. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the one. Wow, that's very reassuring story, you know, in the context of Web3. Yeah. Also, like when you said dot com, I felt that like it's such a boomer domain right now. <laughs> you know, having dot com is like <laughs> oh yeah. Everyone goes for X Y Z or like E T H or Sol or like whatever. <laughs> like well, com seems like so 
old school? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah, because actually before that, they, they were called object.bid. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that there are links hidden on Twitter due to that domain. So maybe mm -hmm. that's why they changed it, but ah, I'm okay. not sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ivona, a lot for this conversation. It was fascinating to really go under the hood and, and you know, see the life of NFT artists because everyone's talking about NFT, everyone's talking <laughs> about art, but very few people talk about artists. And that's why I was so interested in having you here today. I have one last question for you. Do you have any ideas for whom I should interview next, who would like to talk in the way that we have talked? Yeah, actually, I definitely have quite a lot of ideas. I can send you the names afterwards, mm -hmm. but like the one that comes into my mind is on thin ice it's a very interesting creator who also created a project that was community based she created this babel structure where a lot mm -hmm. of artists were living and there is 50 artists living on that so it's a huge artwork that is prepared in a very detailed way so yeah you should definitely check it out there's also a lot of ai artists that i follow and i greatly admire that would also recommend you them so there is not radek there's claire silver there's jenny pasanen or there is just a lot of them so i can definitely send you a huge list of ai artists yeah that would be very happy to get interviewed okay Thanks a lot, Dan. And it was very interesting to talk with you. I'm very happy that we had this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me here. And yeah, also thank you for a very interesting conversation and the questions that were a very uh, interesting to answer to. Okay, thanks a lot and have a good day, Ivona. Thank you. You too. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs>